All right, well, let's go ahead and start and um, we'll monitor the attendees and, oh, wait, one more. <laughs> and um, allow people to, to enter the presentation. Um, for those of you that I don't know that are on the call, I'm Jane Lewis and I'm the executive director at Villa Finale. Also on the call is Farah Varga, who is our manager of marketing and programs. And she will be monitoring <clears throat> the chat. Um, I don't know what you call it, the chat line. <laughs> As uh, people may have comments or questions during the presentation, um, please put them into a chat so that Farah can monitor those. Also, uh, we will have you muted during the call. Uh, but if you have any technical difficulties, again, put it in a chat and we'll um, see if we can address it. So welcome on this hopefully rainy evening. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first session of our annual series. We've been doing this, I think this is our sixth year. And we started doing it as a salon series in the Napoleon parlors where we would have an intimate conversation with a whole variety of fascinating people. And every year has a different topic. Uh, this year it's called Power of a Legacy because this would be the 100th birthday year of Walter Mathis, who was a gentleman who bequeathed his estate, the lovely Villa Finale, to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So in honor of his 100th year um, anniversary of his birth, uh, we're doing things that he personally found particularly interesting. Uh, one, which will be the topic of tonight, was hospitality. He was famous for his parties and his hospitality in Villa Finale, and so we want to honor that interest uh, this evening. Uh, later in the series, uh, we will have uh, speakers on uh, military history, on collecting, and on historic preservation, which of course were interest of his as well. But tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Olivier Bourguin, who is a wine broker and a freelance food writer. I've known Olivier for a few years. He's done some amazing wine, wine tastings at Villa Finale, which is what we had originally thought we would do tonight. But thanks to the pandemic, we've had to change our plans a little bit and we're doing this virtually. But Olivier is also a freelance writer. He specializes in producing food, wine, and restaurant-centric articles for several local publications. He also works in wine sales as an independent wine broker and he has been featured as a weekly guest on uh, KTSA Radio since 2001. And you may have heard of him as Olivier the Wine Guy. He's also given lectures on wine-related topics to a number of groups, including the San Antonio Museum Society, National Public Radio, and the Institute of Culture, Texas Culture's Adult Education Program. And he's currently working on a food-centric book with the San Antonio theme, which I can't wait to see. So it's my pleasure to introduce Olivier, who will give us a presentation on hospitality with a wine theme. Olivier. Good evening. One for a evening. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. Um, it's, it's a little intimidating because I'm sure that some of you know as much about wine as I do. Uh, so as uh, Jane introduced me, Olivier the Wine Guy, uh, they've asked me to speak tonight and uh, as uh, true to form for myself, I'm not a big planner, so I didn't really know what I was going to talk about, but I knew I wanted to make it uh, informative and fun uh, because I think we all agree that uh, we all need a little fun in our lives with, uh, after dealing with the pandemic for six months. So um, people ask me often, uh, how I got started in the wine business. So I grew up in Paris and uh, I attended the Catholic school and I got started in the wine business by selling church wine to the priests when I was an altar boy. No, that's not true at all. That's actually a totally a made up story, but it usually is a good uh, icebreaker. I was never an altar boy, not even close. Uh, 
but the true story is that I am from Bergen. My family is from Burgundy. And you all know what Burgundy is famous for. Uh, wine and mustard. Uh, but uh, what types of wines? So the wines of Burgundy are made uh, with Chardonnay for the whites, Pinot Noir for the reds, and there's a little tiny bit of Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris and a very, very minute amount of uh, Sauvignon Blanc as well. Um, and of course there is Aligoté and Gamay. Uh, Gamay is what is used to make Beaujolais. And uh, I had a question uh, that was pre-asked before the beginning of this program about what it is that makes uh, Beaujolais unique and what time of the year is available. So to call a Beaujolais a French Beaujolais is redundant because to be Beaujolais, it has to be French and from the Beaujolais region. It's actually a sub-region of uh, Burgundy. Um, Beaujolais is made with a grape called Gamay. G-A-M-A-Y. And uh, there are three types of Beaujolais. There is the Beaujolais Village, which is released uh, on uh, the third Thursday of November. And it used to be a little bit more popular than it is now. It was kind of a fad and people had Beaujolais Nouveau parties. Uh, it's fallen a little bit uh, out of uh, favor Main reason being that Beaujolais Nouveau really is not great wine, to be honest. Uh, and the market got flooded uh, during the uh, late 90s, early 2000s with, with uh, Beaujolais that was not very good. So um, there are a few that can be decent, but uh, most of them are not interesting. There are also some uh, Beaujolais village which uh, are much more interesting and those can be cellared for uh, maybe a couple years and then if you want a really good Beaujolais then you have to be willing to purchase what is called Beaujolais Cru and there are only 10 of those and I'm sure you've heard some of the names uh, Moulin Avant is a famous one, Brouilly, uh, Chirouble, Morgon to name a few of the 10. So that's uh, all I'm going to say about uh, Beaujolais for the moment. But Burgundy itself is, um, is an, uh, as, as is wine, uh, inexhaustible subject. Um, it used to be that uh, Burgundy produced a wine that was called Fromento. It spells F-R-O-M-E-N-T-E-A-U. And that is probably what we know today as Pinot Gris or also as Pinot Grigio. Pinot Gris in French, Pinot Grigio in Italian. And uh, Gamay was actually outlawed by the Duke of Burgundy uh, back in 1300 and something uh, as a wine that was vile and disloyal and unfit for human consumption. Uh, at the time, the Beaujolais region was not really con considered to be part of Burgundy. It was more considered part of uh, the Lyonnais region. So a little bit of a protectivism was taking place there. Uh, Burgundy was very good uh, as a trading uh, region to promote their products. And uh, they basically, at the time, the main way to, for wines to travel was through waterways and there's a river that runs through Burgundy called Yonne, Y-O-N-N-E and so uh, the rulers of Burgundy, the dukes of Burgundy were very good at blocking wines coming in from the Rhone Valley so they wouldn't make it to Paris and the wines from Burgundy would and then they were competing with the wines of Champagne so uh, today the wines of Champagne are sparkling, first of all, which they used to not be 300 years ago. And Champagne is made with uh, seven different types of grapes, but mostly with uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. The other grapes are used for, uh, for blending, really. Uh, so the, um, if, if a Champagne is made with uh, white wine exclusively, 
usually in Chardonnay, it's called the Blanc de Blanc. And if it's made with uh, Pinot Noir exclusively, then it's called the Blanc de Noir. So the reason Champagne, the Champagne region began to, to grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir is because they wanted to compete with Burgundy. Because back then, 300 years ago, Champagne was making wines that were still wines. And they were mostly made with uh, the grape I mentioned earlier, the Fromenteau, which, was, uh, which is basically the same thing as Pinot Gris. Um, the other, one of the other main regions of France uh, that produces wine, and there, there are many, but the one that's most well known other than Burgundy and Champagne is Bordeaux. Uh, what's the difference between the wines of Burgundy and Bordeaux? Which wines are better? Hmm, that's a debate that's going to go on forever. It depends if you prefer drinking Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot-based wines, or if you prefer to drink uh, Pinot Noir wines. Personally, I prefer Pinot Noirs. I think they're more elegant, and and um, but you know, doesn't mean I don't like Bordeaux wines either. But Bordeaux owes a lot of its uh, success, actually, uh, and its wine. Uh, uh, industry owes a lot of success to, to the British because it was uh, Bordeaux, the Bordeaux region was under British rule for a good period of time. And uh, the British were, were fond of uh, the wines of Bordeaux, so they not only liked to occupy the region, but they also uh, helped to develop the, the wine industry so they could ship wines to England. Uh, other than the grapes and the climate, obviously, uh, another difference between Burgundy and Bordeaux is that in Burgundy, uh, the wines are more terroir oriented, whereas in Bordeaux, they're more producer oriented. So the Burgundy wines are known for, for the specific parcel of land where they come from, whereas, whereas in, in Bordeaux, they're known for the actual Yes, the, the land is important, but the producer that owns the land and how their tradition is, is as important, if not more. Uh, back to Burgundy, just to touch on the point, um, people don't, many people don't know that Burgundy actually also makes sparkling wine. Very little of it, but it's quite good. It's called Crément de Bourgogne. And there are Crément wines that are made in different parts of France. And even though they are made with the same method as the wines made in Champagne, obviously they cannot be called Champagne because only wines that are made in the Champagne region can be called that. It would be like calling a wine from, uh, uh, from uh, North Texas uh, Hill Country. You know, it's, it's the same uh, type of thing. So it's in respect of the region that it comes from. Um, Many of the producers in Burgundy are very small. Uh, they make great wines, but they only produce maybe 100 to 200 cases a year. And they sell direct to the consumer. They have their loyal customers, either uh, individuals or restaurants that will go and buy their wines. And that's all they do. Uh, large producers, the largest one is called Louis Latour, uh, produces in excess of 350,000 cases. So big difference between 100 and 200 cases for a small producer to hundreds of thousands for a large producer. And it doesn't mean the large producers don't make wines that are decent, but it's just not the same animal at all. So back to um, how I got involved in the, in the wine business, the true story. Um, my grandfather was uh, a wine aficionado and he was actually a member of uh, the Chevalerie de Tastevin, uh, which is uh, basically a fraternity uh, that was started by uh, people in Burgundy to help promote their wines as well. And the Tastevin is actually a small silver, silver cup that you wear around your neck and you can go around tasting wine in the cellar from different barrels and you just get a, a real tiny bit. And so this fraternity started out, uh, I think, in the 1930s to help promote the wines of Burgundy. And you have to be invited in. It's a small group. And my grandfather belonged. And, 
and he would go to the auction house in Burgundy uh, once a year and he would select a barrel that he had tasted that he liked and he would buy the whole barrel and bring it back to our family home our vacation home in Burgundy and uh, he and I would uh, would hand bottle it and hand label it and hand cork it so I was exposed to to that process at an early age and and you know I was allowed to taste a little small quantity uh, of wine and appreciated them and then when I was a teenager if I was invited to a friend's party I would uh, always make a detour by my grandfather's house and I would uh, grab a couple of bottles of wines from let's say my birth year for example and show up and give them to the parents of my friend and they would always be astonished that uh, a 15 16 year old would have access to such uh, interesting vintages and I would always play it down and say well you know I have my own stash you know, so so that's really how I got interested in wine but I didn't even get in the wine business until about the mid 90s so there was a long period of time where I enjoyed wine, but I was not involved in the business. But I have to say that it is the longest uh, tenured uh, career that I have uh, enjoyed has been um, wine. Um, I don't know what else, if you want me to expand further, or if you want me to take some questions at this point. Jane, Farah? Jane, you have some questions? Um, well, I think we all probably have a lot of questions. So, Olivier, just generally, as it comes to being a really good host, you know, and if if you and I know that you did go to Walter Mathis's house a few times, um, you and know, I met him. I actually met him. Yes. So, what you know, since he was the quintessential host. What would you anticipate, especially, you know, in the, in the area of wine, what would you expect to be served when you went to, to Villa Finale? Well, I mean, I, I think he was an amateur of wine. I didn't know him, <laughs> well, know his taste, but I would say that he had, uh, he had the means to afford uh, good wines and he was prone to enjoy them. Um, uh, one question that was asked earlier in the program this evening was, uh, uh, what do you pair with Brie? You know, what would be a good wine to pair with Brie? Well, personally, I think like, a, again, a nice Chardonnay from Burgundy is probably one of the best pairings for Brie. Not to say that other ones can't go well with it, but that would be my choice anyway. I saw a question pop up. I couldn't read it completely, but it had to say it had something to do with Rosé. I can't hear you, Farah. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Um, we've got one from Lisa that popped up in the question and answer. She said, can you discuss sulfites and their effect on red wines imported to the US? Sure. Technical sure. question, okay. nice. So sulfites are used uh, as a means of stabilizing wine. Uh, it's a preservative. Although, even if you don't use sulfites in wine production, the, 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 the fact that you're making wine is going to create a small amount of sulfites. So there's, that's why you cannot see on the wine bottle label that will say no sulfites, because that would be illegal, because there might be some trace amount. But you can see bottles where it will say no sulfites added. Uh, sulfites have had the reputation of uh, promoting uh, migraines or headaches in, in, in uh, the consumption of wine that have sulfites. So if you have had that experience, it's probably a good idea to try to avoid those wines. It used to be that um, most of the wines that were uh, organic wines up to maybe 15, 20 years ago were not of good quality. It's not so true anymore. There are now some really good high quality wines produced all over the world that are 100% organic with no sulfites added. So if you experience, experiment, uh, if you experience having uh, issues with headaches after drinking wine, then maybe you should try to experiment with uh, wines that have no sulfites added, uh, organic wines, for example. Also another thing, if you take an antihistamine before 
you drink wine and you have experienced headaches before, taking an, an antihistamine may alleviate the headaches. Kind of following up on the, the rosé, we did have another question uh, from one of the, the attendees who says, I really like rosé and notice that it's priced very reasonably. Is there a certain price range or label that you would suggest? Well, I, I, I can, many, uh, you know, I represent a portfolio of over 4,000 different labels and, and probably I would say maybe 30 or 40 good rosés in there. So uh, I think um, probably the best thing uh, in order to make, to not create a, you know, a commercial event would be, uh, I'm happy to have people contact me uh, after the program and to give them uh, suggestions for um, some rosés. Uh, I can give you one that I drink frequently because I've been fortunate to actually uh, stay at the Chateau. It's a uh, rosé Bordeaux. And since I have my daughter and her husband online, uh, that, that wine was served at their wedding. It's a uh, Chateau Goody Show. Uh, my daughter got to stay there as well. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful little um, uh, domain. And um, uh, it's made 100% with Cabernet Franc. So here's one that I can throw out. And it's probably uh, in the market for under, under $15. Um, Linda in chat says that's a good point about antihistamines, uh, sulfides and wine and other things she consumes make her wheeze. So probably antihistamine would prevent that as well. Um, Doug asks, what is your favorite dish to have with wine? Oh gosh, that, that is an impossible, <laughs> that is an impossible question to answer, uh, because of the multitude of dishes and the multitude of wines. Um, you know, I, I could try to pick a, a favorite dish and a favorite wine that would go with it, for example, perhaps. Let's say um, if you like lamb, and uh, by the way, um, if you like lamb, I can also supply that because I also broker uh, lamb and duck meat for uh, organic farmers. Uh, I love uh, Côte du Rhône with lamb. Uh, to me, Côte du Rhône is, is the perfect wine for, for nice racquet lamb. Côte du Rhône is made, um, is a region that is a little bit further south than Burgundy. And uh, um, the majority of the wines that come from Côte du Rhône are made with Grenache, Syrah, Mourvèdre, or a combination of those. And there are a few other grape varieties that exist there as well, but those are the three main ones. In fact, to make it simple in the United States in the trade, we call those wines GSM, Grenache, Syrah, Mourvèdre, just to for short. I, if you don't mind, I have a question that's been driving me nuts. Um, we, uh, we, we had a Riesling um, on, when we were traveling recently that was very dry and crisp and very, very tasty. It paired really well with cheese. And we haven't been able to replicate that type of experience with Riesling at home because we don't know what to pair it with. What, how do you pair Riesling with food? We're, we don't, we're, we're completely lost. If, if, you like, if you like blue cheese, Riesling goes really well with blue cheese. Um, the, the Riesling, like any wine, can be made in any degree of sweetness. You, so, you know, people who say, uh, I don't like Riesling because it's sweet. Well, again, they may not have had the the good fortune to taste some dry Rieslings. Uh, you can make a sweet anything. You can, you can make a sweet Merlot or a sweet Cabernet if you want to. Uh, it's all in the winemaking process, really. And sometimes people confuse sweetness with fruitiness. A wine can be very fruity, but not sweet. And that's a very difficult distinction to acquire because you think fruity, sweet, but no. If, if a wine is very well made and has a lot of uh, good fruit extraction, and you can find the taste elements of the fruit in the wine, it doesn't mean that wine is sweet. So Olivia, I have a question along those same lines. I've been told that the higher the alcohol percentage in the wine, 
that means that it is less sugar and less sweet, which should make it drier. Is that the no. case? Is that true? Totally not true. Okay. Totally not true. How do you know if you're getting a dry, not sweet wine? Well, I guess you have to. If you don't, if you don't know, you have to taste it. If, if right. you don't have one to advise you, but but um, no, there they are there are many um, uh, wines that are high alcohol that are not sweet, and there are some high alcohol wines that are sweet. So again, it has nothing to do. Um, the the sweetness of the wine does not has nothing to do with the quality of the wine, obviously. Um, Deborah asks, what is your thought on Shiraz? Is that, am I saying that right? Shiraz? So Shiraz is, uh, yeah. is the word that is used in uh, mostly Australia and South Africa for a grape, which I mentioned earlier from the Rhone region of France called Syrah. So it's the same grape, but in uh, the Southern hemisphere, they have chosen to call it Shiraz. Um, there are some fantastic Shiraz wines, and there are, again, some that are not very pleasant. Uh, it's true of any country, any wine producing region, any grape varietal. When people say to me, oh, I love Cabernet, but I don't like Merlot. You know, I say, have you ever tasted, have you tasted every Merlot in the world? Well, no, of course not. Well, let me make it my mission to find a Merlot that you will love. And it's a fun challenge because I can guarantee you that I will find, and that's true across the board. People say, well, I don't like wines from Spain. Or I don't like, come on, seriously? You, you cannot make generalizations like that about anything really, but especially not about wine. We've got some amazing questions coming in. Um, this is a really good one. What types of wine would you suggest having on hand for entertaining to satisfy as many of your guests tastes as possible. So a kind of a crowd pleaser wine. Well, I, I would probably want to have more than one wine. For one thing, if you want to appeal to the majority of your guests, you're going to want to have uh, at least a few choices. So depending on how, the size of your group, uh, depending on whether you're serving food or not, depending on what time of the day, what time of the year, all those, uh, and of course, depending on your budget. So, so it's not a cookie cutter answer, but you know, I would try to have a selection of wines that across the a cross section of wines, such as, for example, a rosé, a white, a red, a sparkling, maybe something a little sweeter for people who may want to socialize and enjoy a glass of wine, but they don't really, their palate does not appreciate dry wines, so you don't want to cut them out. So that's what I would do, but. Um, and I would, I would uh, probably get wines that are mid-price. You know, you don't want to be splurging on on crowds unless you have a uh, very select guest list of people whom you know are very wine knowledgeable and are going to appreciate high-end wines. Then, if you're having a small dinner party with um, half a dozen guests and you're having a, a you know a five-course meal you're probably not going to serve the same wines as if you have hosting a party for a hundred people for a quinceanera. Okay. This one's a, this one's surprising. A friend of mine has a 75 Chateau Latour. He's wondering if he should drink it, save it or sell it. Um, I would uh, drink it because selling it would be, I don't know that you could sell it because People are going to be a little leery of something that's 25 years old and not knowing how it's been cellared. Uh, I, you know, you'd, you'd really have to have trust in the provenance on how the wine has been kept to pay the type of uh, uh, the money that, it, that, that that wine is probably worth. So I would, unless you really, really need the money and you you, you must sell it, I would drink it. But it's probably time to drink it anyway. You know, I, I, I'll tell you a little personal story. A friend of mine who lives in Boston, French friend of mine, uh, has a friend who also lives in Massachusetts. And her husband passed away last year. And he was a wine collector. So 
she invited my friend to come to his house, to her house uh, to to check the collection and he says they were about 1500 bottles of wine so you think about someone who's in their mid 50s they're never going to drink 1500 bottles of wine so what do you do with the wine well you have to inventory you have to catalog it and they opened a bottle of 1957 petrus i think it was and it was it was not good it was it had it was it was it had turned to to vinegar so that's kind of sad when you think about all those wonderful wines that may go to waste if you don't do something with them so you know waiting for the right occasion yes i can understand that but the right occasion is drink your wine and enjoy it don't let it sit on the shelves until it's no longer good to drink i i i read something about about people in france and of course since you are french you might be able to answer this that they do not drink the wine that they buy they drink the wine that their grandparents bought and they buy wine to put away for their grandchildren to drink do you find that that's true or was that an exaggerated story that i read for a fact well no it, it's true to to a small degree okay so um first of all very few wines are made to be cellared and to be kept. The majority of wines, 98% of the wine produced in the world today is meant to be consumed within six months to two years, max. And the joke is, do you age your wine? Oh yes, from the shelves on the store to my house. Because th th those wines are not going to get better. They have no potential for getting better. They're only going to get worse over time past a year or two or three. So, so that's one type of wine. The very small percentage of wine that is made to be cellared and that can be cellared and only if it is done according to the proper conditions uh, of light, humidity, temperature, and it has to be constant. And you also have to keep them horizontal so the cork stays dry, stays, stays wet. And um, only those wines will get better over time. But even then, there's a curve. They're going to get to a peak and then they start losing some of their qualities. So the trick is to, to drink them or sell them at their peak. And every wine is, wine is different. And you could drink a bottle you could drink two bottles that are from the same vintage, the same vineyard, the same winemaker, everything. And one could be good one day and the next day you open another one. It could be fantastic, even better, or it could be worse. And that does happen. I've got another sort of a little bit technical question. What grape varieties do you think are best suited for growing and making wine in Texas? Well, Texas is finally learning to, uh, the Texas wine industry has had a long road to where it is today. Texas is now the fifth largest wine producing state in the country. And it has been for a while actually. But um, the problem was that uh, Texas started out trying to make wine from grape varieties that were not suited to Texas. So now they are making wines from, let's say, for example, Tempranillo, which is a very popular Spanish grape. And I have to say, there are some very good Texas wines. There are now, I believe, between four and 500 wineries in Texas. And uh, out of those, there's probably a handful or two that make good wines. And for every winery that makes 20 different types of wine they probably make two or three that are good and and the others are either average or just okay so and another problem uh, you know the texas wines uh, wines uh, have not reached uh, critical mass yet in the production so yes there are some very good wines and, and i do support the texas wine industry and i do buy some and sell some uh, and represent some of the brands. 
but you really have to want to help support the Texas wine industry, which we should to a degree, because there are so many hundreds. You go to a store and you see all the hundreds of different labels on the shelves. And the Texas wines are a little bit on the pricier side for com in comparison to what's on the market. So they haven't quite gotten to the point where you can say, mm, do I buy a, a $10 Tempranillo from Spain or do I buy a $15 Tempranillo from Texas? Mm, you know, I don't know. Um, Linda asks, uh, what are the other four states that you mentioned? In so the first, to Texas. the first one everybody knows it's California okay the second one and the third one everybody knows uh, Washington State and Oregon the fourth one people almost never know unless they are in the wine industry or they are more wine savvy so the fourth one is the state of New York so Olivier talking about um, California wines which I think you know, a lot of us probably know more about than French wines. Uh, with all the, the recurring fires that have been going on in Napa and Sonoma, um, I mean, I, I was out there about this time last year, and they were just recovering from some fires, and now they're horrible ones again. So what will happen to the wines? I mean, do the vines have the ability to survive and come back, or does it take years to replace them and regrow the wines um, and those that do survive how does it impact the flavor of the wine i'm sure the quality must change so if a vineyard burns i mean if, if the grapes are are, are uh, you'd have to replant and it takes several it's, it, it does take several years for a grapevine to to produce but um thankfully and I don't know about the current, uh, the current problems with the fires. I haven't heard any major problems with any wineries. Uh, most of them survived, did fairly well the last time there were fires. Uh, it didn't affect them too greatly, but I'm sure there are a few uh, individual here and there that got affected. I, I don't have the specific of which ones those are. I think as an industry for the state, it may have a little impact. I don't think it's going to be a huge impact as long as it doesn't continue to, to be uh, the trend uh, every year. Um, we had a question about Italian reds. Um, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty vague question, so you could probably expand upon it for a while, but can you talk a bit about Italian reds? Maybe some favorites or some suggestions? Sure. So, you know, I, I'm, I am French and I, even though I, I'm a little partial to French wines, I like good wines. I don't, it doesn't matter to me where the wine is made. You know, if it's from Argentina, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Italy, Spain, Portugal, you name it, you know, it doesn't matter. If the, if the wine is good, I'm going to give it credit for the quality of the wine. Um, Italy makes fantastic wines. There are many that that uh, think that Italy and France make the best wines in the world. And that's probably true that the very, very, very best wines that are made, uh, the top of the top are probably produced in France and Italy. There are some fantastic Italian red wines, Barolos, Brunellos, uh, Amarones. Uh, and they make some uh, very good uh, Pinot Noir, which is called Pinot Nero in Italian. Uh, and, uh, you know, most people know about, I don't know about you, Fair, if I were to ask you, how many different grape varieties do you know, just off the top of your head? Just shoot a number. Um, ten. Jane? <laughs> how many different varieties of wine do I know off the top of my oh, head? Yeah. Great varietals. Oh, great varieties. Great varietals. Oh, maybe 10. <laughs> so that's about, you know, the norm, okay? There are over 9,000 grape varieties that are used in the world to make, to make wine. About 3,000 of those at least are in Italy. So even if you split it in half and you say half of those are red, half, that means there's 1,500 varieties of red 
grapes, roughly, in Italy alone. And now some of those are the same. They, they may have a very slight genetic difference. Uh, now that we have the use of DNA, then we can, we can actually differentiate them. Uh, but overall, there's so much. You know, you, 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 it's, uh, you, you could spend your life studying just that just grape varieties um not a week or a month goes by where i don't discover or get introduced to, to a, a new grape variety i've never tasted in my life before and i've probably tasted hundreds but you know uh recently i got to taste the wine from the republic of georgia and it's called the variety is called saperavi s-a-p-e-r-a-v-i i had never tasted that before and it is now recognize that the Republic of Georgia was probably the birthplace of viticulture in antiquity. So this particular grape varietal, Sapiravi, is probably one of the ancestors of all the other, genetically, all the other grape varieties that exist today. How was it? It was fantastic. So, Farah, I think we have a few other questions coming. We do, in. we do. Yeah, um, this is a this is a interesting one. Have you ever tasted Rock and Hammer? It's a Pinot Noir, uh, and the next question will be Pinot Noir too related. So keep that in mind. Pinot Noir from Greg Popovich's winery. Yeah, I was going to say yes. It, it is a winery of which he is a, an owner, and I have tasted it, and it is it is very well made. Greg Popovich is a is, is an interesting person who is a very wine knowledgeable and um, who has bought wine from me before uh, for his personal consumption and uh, he knows his wines and uh, uh, he actually also I believe owns shares in another winery called A to Z. This is the second part of that question. Can you access it to sell? I you cannot. may have a customer. <laughs> no, no, okay. I, I cannot because uh, in Texas, uh, as in most states in the, in the United States, we have what is called a three-tier system, and this was uh, established to prevent uh, the uh, mafia from uh, infiltrating the uh, liquor business after prohibition. And so when you represent a brand, let's say, for example, Rock and & Hammer, and I'm not sure who represents that brand, another uh, distributor cannot represent that brand as well. It's segregated in that way. So it's not one of the brands I represent, but as mentioned earlier, I probably represent another uh, 200 different Pinot Noirs that are, and I can guarantee you I can find one that is probably as good or better for the same price or less. Not to, as I said, I think Rock and Hammer is wonderful. And I, I've, I've had it, I've enjoyed it. Uh, and I'm not even going to disparage it in any way, but but it's not one of the brands that I that I sell. Um, another question about Pinot Noir, which is clearly very po popular: um, What foods pair well with Pinot Noir? Everything. Pinot Noir is the king. People say, you know, people say Cab is king. Well, okay, I get that. In California, in Napa, that it's it's a it's a cliche sentence, but to me, we have a a little uh, joke in industry that we ask each other, if you were stranded on a deserted island and you could only have one case of wine, what would it be? Well, mine would be Pinot Noir for sure. Uh, you know, and if I could, if I had my choice, it would be the best of the Pinot Noir, which is, you know, it sounds a little bit elitist when you say that, it's uh, Domaine Romani Conti, which each bottle goes for upward of $800 a bottle, up to $2,000 a bottle, but you know. I've 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 tasted it. I've never bought it. So we're going back to Cali. Um, someone has a question about California wines. Do they seem to? They seem. She says they seem to have a higher alcohol content than other regions. Is that something that um, is actually a thing, or it's something she's noticed, but she's not sure if that's actually a thing? No, I don't think that's. <laughs> I don't think that's true at all. Uh, there are certain types of wines that have typically more alcohol, like for example, Red Zinfandel. And there are a lot of Red Zinfandels that are made in California. Uh, Red Zinfandel is actually the only native North American grape 
that is native to North America. That's, that's, uh, but now, again, with uh, the advantage of DNA testing, they have been able to find out that it is actually a descendant of an Italian grape called Primitivo, which probably was imported by Italian settlers and eventually mutated slightly to become what we now know as Red Zinfandel. And Red Zinfandel usually packs at least 15% alcohol up to 17 or 18%. So uh, in that respect, yes, Red Zinfandels, and many of them are from California, uh, have a higher alcohol content. I don't think that's true across the board for California wines in general. Um, so we're, uh, we're clearly traversing the, the globe here because so we're going back to France now. Um, this person asks, we used to talk of great French vintage years. Are there notable vintages since 2000? You know, I, I'm not well versed in that uh, unless I would actually do the research and look it up. And I, I, it's, not, it's not my forte. It's not what I deal with. And I don't deal in uh, the high-end uh, vintage wines. Not that I can't get them or enjoy them, but it's just not what I do. So I do not know the answer to that question. I, I, I'm sure there have been some vintage years that have been better than others. But again, it also depends on the region. You can have a great year in Burgundy and not so good year in Bordeaux or vice versa. I have a question. It's actually a question from my husband. Um, I have a photo here from the Sandemont um, Port. What is it? A, a, is it a winery or is it a distillery? I don't know. Well, no. Port, Where they make the port. Port, port is not is not distilled, but it is um, it is wine that is married with brandy. Okay. So it has brandy added to the wine to make it port. So what, what are your thoughts about Portuguese wine beyond port? I think Portuguese wines right now are a very good value uh, because the Portuguese government is, uh, is sponsoring the wine industry a little bit to compete with the Spanish wines. And so that has that occurred over a period of years for different countries. For example, Australia did that for a while, uh, about 15, 10, 15 years ago. There were a lot of really good, inexpensive Australian wines on, in, on the, in the US market. And that was because the Australian government was sponsoring the Australian wine industry. Uh, then the Spanish got in on the game and currently, or more recently, the Portuguese government has been doing the same thing. So you can find some really good uh, quality Portuguese wines uh, at a fairly bargain price. So Olivia, you, you mentioned uh, two or three times about blends in wines, different grapes, and like with the port, that that's wine and brandy. And I've also noticed a trend of wine being aged in different kinds of, of containers, like um, some that may have had port or may have had, uh, you know, whiskey or, you know, and like Chardonnay is now being aged in stainless instead of oak. Uh, is this just a trend or is this something that you see has some value and lasting power? Yes, it does, because it does, it does um, create a totally different taste profile for the wine. Uh, Aging wine in, in stainless steel has been around for a long time, but mostly for Sauvignon Blanc, more so, more so than for Chardonnay. Um, there are even wineries that age their wines in cement vats, cement uh, uh, containers, basically. Um, I carry a wine that's made in bourbon barrels, and it's, you know, it's, it's tasty, it's different. I wouldn't say it's a fad. I, th I would say it's a, it's a way to... Uh, create new opportunities for people, maybe who are whiskey drinkers or bourbon drinkers, to say, oh, that's interesting. I'm not a wine drinker, but I'll try that, you know, and, and try to create uh, new markets for a product. Um, and why not? All right. Um, well, we're approaching the end of our hour, um, and I think we have answered most of the questions. If anyone has anything 
else that they would like to ask, um, let us know. Let's see. I think we just got we have one. one we have one more. Oh, we've got a couple more. Um, isn't it always better in oak barrels? No, it's not always better in oak barrel. It depends on what you what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, again, aging wine in oak, whether it's white or red, will give it a different taste, but it doesn't mean it's better. It may be better to someone's palate, but not to someone else's palate. Uh, it also depends on what kind of oak barrels you use, whether you use French oak from what region of France, uh, or you use Slovenian oak, or uh, there, are, there are certain regions of France where the oak is considered to be better. There's a region called Allier, L-L-L-I-E-R, where the barrels that come from that region are considered to produce better wine. Um, you know, a, a good quality high-end uh, wine barrel made by a top cooper today uh, costs upward of $2,000 per barrel. And you can only use it for a few years because every time you use it, it loses some of its, uh, it, it loses the, uh, its capacity to impact the wine. So therefore, new, and so what a lot of uh, winemakers do is they use new oak for six months, then uh, one-year-old oak for six months, and then two-year-old oak barrel for two years, and then they release the wine. So the wine has had the opportunity to what we call sea oak, that's what the term that's used in the industry uh, but uh, and then then they sell they sell the barrels to other wineries that might use them to make an inexpensive wine but they can use the marketing to say well it was made in oak barrels even though the oak may not impart very much by that by then and you can also sell them to make furniture and to do other things with <laughs> someone asked uh, don't they send those barrels to scotland for aging whiskey some some do yeah some do i mean it's it's very it's a very tiny portion of it that that happens but um jane we might have some good closing questions because they're actually about closures wine bottle closures we had two different people ask about them basically at the same time which was kind of strange one person asks um do you have an opinion on alternate closures natural cork versus Stelvin, am I saying that correctly, Stelvin? Mm -hmm. yeah. And another person asks, what is the deal with a nice bottle of wine with the screw lid? So, which I think is a great question. All right, so uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that real cork comes from the bark of a tree. The world cannot produce enough trees to make enough corks to use to make corks for all the wine that's produced in the world anymore. So that's number one. So by virtue of the fact that we produce more wine than is cork available, we cannot use cork on all the wine. Number two, uh, it used to be that uh, wines that were not using cork were not the good wines. It's not so true anymore. I have a friend who's a winemaker in California and he told me the story one time about uh, how he had bought two very expensive bottles of French wine and he, brought him to New York City for New Year's with his wife and at a friend's party and they opened the first one and it was corked. And they opened the second one and it was corked. And so we had spent hundreds of dollars and neither of those two bottles were fit to drink. And that day he said he made the decision he would never use cork on his wines again because he said, I don't want anyone to open one of my wines that I spent my life labor making and to open it and to be disappointed because of a cork taint and so he uses synthetic corks in all his wines but he makes great wines but they are no longer using corks uh, the very high-end expensive wines that are meant to be cellared will probably always use cork cork the benefit to cork is that it produces micro oxygenation and so it helps the wine age. And you want that. The Stelvin will not do that. 
So Stelvin, you can have a very good wine in Stelvin, but again, it's not a wine that you're going to want to keep in the cellar for, for years and years to come. And there are some new alternative closures that are becoming uh, experimental. There is one that's made out of glass actually, and, and it has a little rubber seal and, and the, the neck of the bottle has an indentation. So when you push it down, it's, it locks in. And who knows, with technology now, uh, with new technologies uh, coming to life, we might discover some, uh, some new closures that uh, we could have never thought about before. Well, speaking of closures, um, Olivier, thank you so much for presenting and answering all of our many, many questions. And I'm sure this could go on for a while. I know I have a lot more questions, um, but I, I really do appreciate you kicking off our Power of a Legacy series this evening. And I also wanna thank all the attendees for joining us. Our next um, presentation in this series is on October 8th, and it will feature Ashley Wilson, who is the architect for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So I hope that you will register to join us on October 8th for that presentation. Well, Olivier, I raise my glass to you and to all our attendees and all the staff and, that's on the call. <laughs> if anyone would like to reach out to me, they can find me yes. on Facebook as Olivier the Wine Guy, or they can email me at Olivier the Wine Guy at gmail.com. Cheers. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure you'll be hearing from some of us. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.